I'm thrilled to introduce Debbie Besson, MS, RD, CISO, CLT, um, who is the Nutrition Outreach Manager for Holy Name Medical Center and has over 25 years of experience as a registered dietitian nutritionist with a broad experience within the field. Debbie holds a Master's of Science degree from Queens College and is a board certified specialist in oncology. Ms. Besson believes in food as medicine and has an integrative approach when counseling patients. She specializes in weight management, gastrointestinal issues, food sensitivities, and helping her patients reach their health goals with wellness in mind. Ms. Besson loves sharing her knowledge of nutrition and food and focuses on helpful habits instead of restrictions. Today, she's going to be discussing with us nutrition and gut health. So thank you so very much for joining us today, and the floor is yours. Thank you, and thanks all for attending. Got a nice little turnout here. Um, so yes, I am going to be talking about gut health because there is such a connection with gynecological cancers, treatment, um, and you know, with, with gut health. So I hope, hope to be able to help, and I'm hoping to answer all your questions um, you know, by the end of this session. So I'm going to share my screen. The objectives for today. So we're going to figure out, um, identify different kinds of gut problems. There's lots of them. So I just want to kind of give you an overview of definitions and, and what is what. Um, understand how the diet and lifestyle play a, a very significant role in these diseases. Uh, learn about food sources that promote gut health. And we're going to see a little video at the end on how to prepare one of a, um, a recipe. I won't tell you what it is yet, but it's a recipe that uh, really, really helps with gut health. And I love this quote um, from Hippocrates, all diseases begin in the gut. He also is the one that said food is medicine and medicine is food. Um, and, uh, you know, the gut uh, has been researched a lot lately. Um, it's it's the harbinger of um, you know diseases for and and even more importantly for health and so we'll go over all that so why is gut health so important so our gut contains does any anyone hear of like the term the microbiome so the microbiome uh, meat is a term for all of the trillions of microbes which um, make up the microbiome and um, the goal is for these bacteria, because it is bacteria and other things, is, is to be healthy because these bacteria are actually very important for uh, many, many functions of the gut. So gut microbes are important. Why? Um, for many reasons. Oops, sorry. Uh, digestion and absorption of nutrients. Protection of the interior lining. Signaling of hunger cues. Um, uh, detox, detoxing, detoxing uh, chemicals and toxins, um, controlling inflammation. 75% uh, of your immune system is in the gut, so that is very much affected. And also gene expression. So, um, you know, we all have our genes and the gut um, does reflect on them. So they can turn on genes, they can turn off genes. And so for all those reasons, having a healthy gut is the goal. So the three major gut issues that we're going to talk about today are something called dysbiosis, which means an imbalance of bacteria in the gut, usually, uh, you know, a, a poor bac bacteria versus good bacteria. We're going to talk about intestinal permeability, which means the, um, another term for it is leaky gut, which sounds like a fake thing, but it's actually not. Um, even studies in the New England Journal of Me Medicine are using that term leaky gut. And it just means where the walls of the intestine are not so strong. And so things go in and out of it, things like foods and amino acids and toxins and et cetera. And the other thing we're going to talk about is inflammation. We're not going to talk about acute inflammation, the inflammation that's important to help your body get over, you know, an, an insult to it, but more the chronic inflammation that could be the cause of a lot of chronic diseases. Um, so the first problem is the imbalanced microbiome, also called dysbiosis. And... Um, there's many causes for uh, this dysbiosis. Um, different ways to look at it are more harmful mi microbes than beneficial ones, an overgrowth of a pathogen, not enough ba uh, beneficial bacteria, 
and not enough diversity. So diversity is some, a, a word I'm probably going to use a lot too, because most of the studies show that a diverse microbiome, meaning lots of different kinds of bacterias and probiotics and prebiotics, is a healthy mi uh, uh, microbiome. They've done studies on the microbiomes of kids that are that live in farms and where they have more access to like soils and um and uh so um, they have a more diverse uh microbiome versus a city kid that might not have as diverse of a microbiome and they show a difference in in health there's many many reasons for um dysbiosis or this imbalance of gut bacteria and these are just some some of them um c sections um because as the baby goes through the birth canal, they do get a really nice big dose of a, a very specific probiotics. Um, breast milk also has very important probiotics and, and good gut bacteria that passes on. Antibiotic use, as you would imagine, antibiotics get rid of bad bacteria, but they also get rid of good bacteria. So that's something that has to be monitored. Um, GI infections can cause a dysbiosis, a poor diet, like, uh, you know, um, uh, fast food, um, uh, processed foods, chronic stress, toxins, and low stomach acid. The low stomach acid, most of the reason for that is the low, the low stomach acid, stomach acid is very important. It, it kills off bad bacteria. So if you have a low stomach acid, and we'll go over this in a little bit, it could, it could create a problem with the, with the balance. Problem number two, or this leaky gut, um, some of the causes are chronic stress, the dysbiosis, so there's there's like this, this relationship between the two, surgery, certain medications like aspirins, ibuprofen, um, prednisone or steroid, birth control pills, antacids, and antibiotics, Alcohol in general, doesn't matter what kind, just the alcohol itself can, can increase the, um, especially in, in large doses, can increase the, the um, poor gut wall function. And oh, as always, a poor diet, high sugar, high processed, fast food, et cetera. Uh, some symptoms of leaky gut can include fatigue, uh, certain food sensitivities, bloating, diarrhea, constipation, joint pain, skin rashes, brain fog, and a list, a, a whole list. The third problem is inflammation. So again, we're talking about a chronic inflammation. And uh, it can also be caused by different factors like um, the overgrowth, the pathogenic microbe overgrowth in the gut, which simply is the dysbiosis. So we've heard already two uh, relationships between dysbiosis inflammation and dysbiosis and um and uh, the, the leaky gut. And food sensitivities can also cause inflammation. Gabby, can I interrupt you? There was yes. a question in the chat that's relevant to what you were talking about. Sure. Uh, Cynthia asked, does chemo, which kills off the lining of the intestine, also affect the microbiome? Yeah, yeah, that is one of the medic medications that could um, affect it. And a lot of these medications that I talked about are non-negotiables. You have to take them. Sometimes you have to take an antibiotic. So the, the, the point of, of me, you know, giving this information is to compensate for that, is maybe to take a probiotic or to, to work on your gut health. So there, there's no, there are certain things, of course, like, um, uh, like baby aspirin used to be recommended um, mm -hmm. by all, you know, cardiologists. And I think that's starting to decrease because of so certain nutrient interactions and because of this effect on the microbiome. So certain things are, are just necessary, but good question. So as we talked about those three problems, they're, they're kind of interchangeable. And there's this trifecta effect where one causes the other one and the other one causes the other one. And, and all of them really can affect the microbiome. Um, some, I just want to go over some of the bowel diseases. Um, the first one is IBS or irritable bowel syndrome. And that's really a description of a bunch of um, side effects or uh, syndromes. It's not really, really a diagnosis. It's really more uh, symptoms. Um, IBD or inflammatory bowel disease, those, those are diagnosable. And those are things like Crohn's and ulcerative uh, colitis. 
Uh, Crohn's is often found in like the latter part of the small intestine, but it can, it can affect the whole bowel, where colitis is really only found in the colon. And in both conditions, inflammation and ulcers are visible. So that's a very diagnosable disease. This last one is SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And that's like a dysbiosis. It's when the bad bacteria overgrow the good bacteria. And some of the symptoms are gas. That's a huge symptom. It could be constipation or diarrhea, depending on the source of the bacteria. So there is a way to diagnose this. It's a breath test and um, either a doctor can send you a kit at, and you can do it at home or they can do it in the office if they have the machine. They have you drink some kind of a lactulose solution. And then every 15 minutes, they uh, you breathe into an apparatus and it measures mostly hydrogen and methane. These are two gases. And if, it, it, if, it, if the hydrogen or methane are over a certain amount, that means that there's just too much bacteria that's creating this by, you know, by eating your prebiotics and, and expelling this. And the treatment for that is a very, uh, very specific um, probiotic, uh, not probiotic, sorry, antibiotic called Zyfaximin or Refaximin. And there's other ways to treat this, um, but that's, you know, that's if you go to a gastroenterologist and they test you. But we're finding more and more of this diagnosis. I don't know if you guys ever heard of this, but it's becoming almost an epidemic. We feel like um, almost everybody we're sending for uh, testing is coming out positive. We don't know if it's just being diagnosed more. Or we do have a theory that uh, this COVID or the lifestyle during COVID might have affected this. So um, this is something that we see a lot in our practice. So what do we do about this? Like, you know, what are the what are the functional way to deal with this? So there is something called the five R protocol, and we didn't make this up. This is something that's been go going around in the in integrated functional world on how to deal with gut issues. So I'm going to go over all of them with you. And we don't do we don't typically do all of them. It's a, it's very comprehensive. Mm -hmm. Usually, you know, it's when we see our patients, it's very individualized, and we we use certain components of these. So, but I just want you to get an idea of of what you can do. Um, so what are the, the, what is the five R protocol? It's remove. So we want to remove uh, food sensitivities. We want to remove pathogens. We want to remove toxins. We want to replace, replace things that might not be uh, working so well in your body right now, like the acid, like uh, digestive enzymes. There's a bunch of them and we're going to go through them. Repair. Um, so that after you do the removing and replacing, there's a certain nutrients uh, and, and certain foods that you can eat that help build up the intestinal wall, that help with the, with the balance of the microbes. Then re-inoculate, which just means to get that balance better with either um, uh, probiotic foods or supplements. And then we always like to add the stress-reducing component, which is relax. And we'll go over all that. So the first one is remove. So um, we want to remove foods and micro microbes that compromise the gut. And this can cause dysbiosis, the, you know, imbalance and inflammation. So that would be um, aspirins and ibuprofens. We already talked about that one. Alcohol, which again, depending on the dose, um, it just, it can, it can upset the, the microbiome. Caffeine sugar and sugary foods, processed and refined starches. And those are just things that are like boxed or bagged that have a ton of ingredients in them. And processed vegetable oils and trans fats. So they are good fats and there are fats that are not that great for our gut. Um, foods. So many people go on elimination diets and there's a few ways that you can do it. Um, maintaining a journal and seeing if you can correlate a food with your symptoms. That isn't always so easy because a lot of the um, symptoms that you get after eating a food is delayed. So it's not like an allergy. Allergy symptoms are usually very immediate. And you, you know, if you have an allergy to dairy or if you have an allergy to a, like a nut, usually those symptoms come right away, right after you eat. But with these food sensitivities, it's they, um, it's something else. It's usually a type four or five or type three or four um, hypersensitivity. And those could come up even up to like three days after you eat it. So it's very hard to do that. But 
some people are successful in doing that. Another way to do it is to follow a full elimination diet. And that would mean that you get rid of all of the triggers that have been studied. There are a lot of them. There's dairy, there's gluten, there's soy, there's um, uh, coffee, there's um, corn. Soy is a huge one. So what does that leave you with? <laughs> so the- no, I'm um, sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, what does that leave you with? That leaves you with um, eating uh, meats, certain fruits and vegetables. Um, certain, you know, there's, there, there is a list that you get. You get um, fish, zucchini, carrots, green beans, spinach, olives, and olive oil. And then for the SIBO symptoms, there's something called FODMAP. So that's an acronym for, it's F-O-D-M-A-P, and that's an acronym for all of the um, resistant starches that are in foods that could cause problems. They're, they're all healthy foods, but if you're having this imbalance in bacteria, these higher FODMAP foods might really, um, really irritate it. So sometimes we take that out for a little bit. I'm not a big fan of that diet because it does take away very healthy foods, but some people really like to use that. It's never a diet for always. It's only for symptom management for a little bit until you can repair your gut. Some other things that you can eat are rice, sweet potatoes, um, non-gluten grains, besides corn. And you can also have coconut products. So this would be like a full elimination diet. And then, after, and then also with journaling, reintroducing the foods for a couple of days, uh, two to three days, and seeing if you have some kind of a symptom. You can also follow a partial elimination diet. And that's, you know, you really, it's, most people need help with that, maybe working with a dietitian um, or a health coach, because that's, very hard to do, but uh, it's doable. If you want to keep some things in and just with, with symptom journaling, you can get to the bottom of what's irritating you. A lot of people just go gluten and dairy free because those are two very common irritants. Uh, so sometimes I just have, I don't usually like to do it together. I usually do, let's try gluten free. And then if that doesn't work, bring that back in and let's try dairy free. Uh, but those are two very common ones. And another tool that I use is MRT food sensitivity testing. So this is a food sensitivity test that does not rely on antibodies like a lot of these other food sensitivity tests, but it what it does is it measures your immune system's response with cytokines to uh, 150 foods, and they're actually, I just heard they're actually increasing it now to almost 200 foods, and 30 chemicals. And the chemicals are actually very valuable to know because they'll test things like caffeine, besides coffee, you know, so you can have a, a issue with coffee, but not caffeine or to caffeine, but not coffee. Um, it also can test like food dyes and natural uh, chemicals in foods like solanine or tyramine. It's very valuable. So how, when we get the results, we create a meal plan based on the very lowest of uh, reactions that you have and then build from there. So it's like an elimination diet, but based on your system's reactions to these foods that they measure with blood work. Debbie, I just got a private message. Um, someone asked, what was the first foods you mentioned for elimination? For the full elimination diet? Um, meats, any kind of meat, chicken, fish, zucchini, carrots, green beans, spinach, olives and olive oil, avocado oil, um, rice, sweet potato, and coconut products like coconut oil or coconut, shredded coconut, unsweetened shredded coconut. Thank you. You're welcome. Those are, best. And those are the, those are the fo foods you can eat, not the foods you that, That's how usually you start off with the full elimination diet. And then if your, if your symptoms decrease, then you start adding, you, you know, the other foods in very systematically. You know, you can start with a vegetable, you can start with a fruit, you can start with an oil, whatever, whatever you're missing most, maybe. But, it, you know, these, these elimination diets are not, you're really not supposed to do forever because then you're a couple of things, low nutrient and also your diversity of your microbiome is going to be affected because it's just eating the same foods all the time. So that's not, it's recommended for figuring things out, but not for long-term. Okay. Um, Another thing to remove besides the food sensitivities are the microbes like you would get with the SIBO and inflammation. Um, there's a bunch of um, ingredients in foods and in supplements that would help with that. 
So um, like I said before, you can uh, be prescribed a certain antibiotic called Zyfaximin or Rifaximin. That's very specific for the SIBO. Um, or um, you can also opt for an herbal antimicrobial. And there, these ingredients are in some of the ones that I use. Um, I use a very uh, reputable company called Biocedin uh, if someone wants to go the herbal way. And um, it's very clean. It's in the therapeutic doses. It's been well studied. And that does help a lot of my patients. But I wouldn't like do this on my own. I wouldn't just buy oregano oil. I know a lot of people like to do that because I, I, I think I don't, it's, it'll just take too long. And I don't even know if the oregano oil alone would help because it, it really is, is well studied with this company. So they make one. Uh, removing inflammation um, could be by adding uh, anti-inflammatory foods like um, fish oil or, fat, or fatty fish, salmon, cod, halibut, uh, sardines, mackerel, um, and tuna. They're all really high um, omega-3 rich foods. You can also take a fish oil supplement, which I do recommend if you're not eating enough fatty fish servings a week. Turmeric and curcumin, I'm sure everyone's heard of. Um, they're very well studied to help decrease inflammation. And green tea. There's some other ones too, um, like probiotics will help reduce inflammation, ginger, uh, a, uh, a uh, ant antioxidant called resveratrol or polyphenols. But these are the three most common. We're at the replace now, the second R. So what you wanna do is replace things that might be missing in your system. Stomach acid. As we get older, stomach acid does decrease, HCL. Um, some medications like PPIs or even over-the-counter acid reducers for reflux, lower stomach acid. Um, some of the common symptoms of low stomach acid is bloating, um, burping, um, food, like a, you feel like your food is sitting in your stomach. There is one very simple home test that sometimes I use for measuring stomach acid. And that's on, upon waking. So like a fasting, you drink a glass of uh, water with one teaspoon of baking soda and you drink it in one shot. Then you, you um, time your, your burp. If it's very delayed, it might mean that you have low acid. Uh, so one test doesn't really say it all. So I usually have people do it a couple of times and get an average. And so if you continuously get a very long time until you burp, that is a good suggestion that you have low acid. You can get some testing done too in a doctor's office uh, on your acid levels, but sometimes just adding a little bit of apple cider vinegar or lemon juice or some even some supplements um, called HCL, it, it does help. Digestive enzymes is another one that gets affected with gut issues. And some of those symptoms are also bloating, um, undigested food in the stool, as you would imagine, because you don't have that many di digestive enzymes. And those are really easy. Um, there's a lot of them on the market. I usually recommend something with uh, a bunch of different enzymes that break down all of the components of food, carbohydrate, protein, and fat. Because there are some that just um, have, like like Beano, for example, um, will will help you with carbohydrates, but not with the fat and the protein. So depending on what the issue is, or depending on you know, uh, it, it might be invaluable to get kind of an all inclusive digestive enzyme. Um, bile um, is something that the gallbladder extracts when you eat fat. It helps break down fat. And so I usually see a problem with bile when people are either having a problem with their gallbladder or if it was removed. And that's something else that you can, um, eat, actually eating a lot of fiber helps with, with uh, taking away bile, or you can also take a supplement, um, like a, an added bile supplement. Cleansing waves is um, something that your body does when you're fasting to kind of like muscle movement to help detox what's in your gut. And sometimes that's not working very well and you get kind of a backup of debris. 
Um, so some of the ways to improve cleansing waves, first, there's these motility agents that you can use. Some of the natural ones are ginger, um, but there's other ones too. But also adding um, apple cider vinegar or lemon juice can also help that. But also just like fasting in between meals without snacking or having a long fast between dinner and the next day's breakfast. And by long, I mean maybe 13 hours. Um, which is very reasonable, but your body really does need those fasting times to help kind of get rid of the, the debris, so to speak. And nutrients. So a lot of, with a lot of these issues, the diet changes, but also with low acid, uh, a lot of nutrients need acid to get absorbed. And so with low acid, with uh, the diet changes, with um, maybe a fat malabsorption, some nutrients do get lost. So it is important to um, you know, maybe be on a good multivitamin or just make sure that you're, you're getting um, nutrients in an alternative way until you, your gut health has improved. Uh, the third R, I think we're on three, it's repair, so repair damage. Um, and this is where some uh, food components and some supplements can really help with decreasing the inflame, inflammation, helping the gut wall get, you know, sturdier. And here are some of them. It gelatin and bone broth. So bone broth because of the, um, the gelatin and the collagen can be really helpful. L-glutamine is an amino acid that they found to be um, one of the gut's best um, resources for fuel. Colostrum, which I really don't dabble in, but that was one of them. And zinc carnosine has been really well studied at 75 milligrams twice a day for uh, rebuilding the, the gut wall. Now we're at the fourth, so that's re-inoculate. Uh, so re-inoculate with probiotics. Um, so we'll talk about probi probiotics first. So probiotics you can find in food, in fermented food. I'll show you the, the, best, the best sources. The one that's missing here that I like a lot is sauerkraut. Uh, sauerkraut you can find in the supermarket now, but you have to be careful because they're not all, if the ones that are pasteurized or the ones that are heated or the ones that are made with like a, more of a sugar and um, vinegar, those, those, those don't have the bacteria. So what you're looking for is a raw sauerkraut that is fermented with, with salt. And um, some of the best options, I don't know if you guys shop at Trader Joe's, but they have a really good um, raw sauerkraut, but I also see them in regular supermarkets. One of the brand names that I see a lot is called Bubby's. And so they have a lot of things. They have pickles, they have sauerkraut, they have some other fermented vegetables um, in the refrigerator section that you can cho choose. So if that's something you like, I highly, highly recommend that. And then of course, the fermented dairies like yogurt and kefir. And kefir is actually one of the highest probiotic counts than any of the uh, fermented dairies. Some people don't like it because it is a little soury, but um, I, I love it. I have it every day. And then kombucha is also is a fermented um, uh, beverage. And that's also, you know, taste specific. Some people like it, some people don't, but that's also another great way to add uh, some probiotics to your, your diet. And then of course, another way is supplementation. Um, there's plenty of supplements out there that uh, have probiotics. And the cool thing about it, the cool but confusing thing about the probiotic um, business industry is that they're really becoming strain specific, which is great. A lot of studies showing that this strain will help with constipation or that strain will help with COVID, I've even seen, or this strain will help. But it, it, does, get con it does get confusing. It's great that they're doing that. Um, but, you know, that's a, a lot more products out there to have to choose from, really. So um, besides probiotics, there are prebiotics and something called resistant starches, which they're kind of the same, but not really. Um, they're carbohydrates that are found in plant foods that resist digestion in your small intestine so that it, when it reaches your large intestine, it's, it's good food for your probiotics. And that leads to something called short chain fatty acids, um, which is very beneficial for, for gut health. And so the resistant starches are, can help creating these prebiotics. So um, most food have, most plant foods has prebiotics. Um, some have more than others. And the whole aspect of resistant starches 
being able to ferment in the large intestine is, is really one of the best ways to improve your gut health. And I'll just give you some examples. So these are uh, examples of prebiotic foods, and some of them are more resistant than others. And so just to go over them real quick, um, bananas, but, but underripe bananas, so like more of a green banana. And then apples, chicory root, inulin, onions and garlic are one of the best. Asparagus, quinoa, kiwis, pears, cherries, mangoes, leafy greens, flaxseed, which is why I recommend almost to all my patients ground up flaxseed on a daily basis, because besides it being a good prebiotic, it is also really high in soluble fiber. So that's good for bowel movements. It also ha has a lot of cancer protective um, properties, especially for breast cancer and other hormonal cancers. Uh, so I'm like a big fan of that. A lot of really good studies with flax seeds. Um, beans are also very important for this, uh, the prebiotic content. Um, and then if you look all the way to the right, I did a lot of cooked and cooled rice, cooked and cooled potato, cooked and cooled oats. And that's because when you cook one of these carbohydrates and then cool it and eat it cold, the starch changes. And they've done a lot of studies on this. And even with diabetics, diabetics who eat hot rice, like cooked hot rice, have a higher glycemic response than the same amount of rice that's cooked and cooled. And that's because the starch changes and it becomes resistant. So your body's not absorbing it all in the small intestine. And that's a really easy, great way to add prebiotics because you can do like a potato salad or you can do um, like a, a rice salad too. Um, Debbie, there was a question. Nancy asked, you mentioned a good multivitamin. What's considered a good multivitamin? And she's wondering if you can have sugar um, ginger every day. Mm. Um. Sugar ginger, I guess it's like a, a candy, right? I'm sorry, I said sugar. I don't know. I read sugar, but she didn't write that. <laughs> ginger. If you oh, have ginger every day. Yes, why not? Absolutely. In what form? In any form. In tea, in in a as a, as an herb. Um, if you just wanna uh, you know, yeah, why not? Absolutely. And your uh the multivitamin question. So um multivitamins. So a little bit of everything, um, something clean. So it doesn't have like a lot of my patients like chewy, chewy uh, gummies and the compliance is really good for that. But two things, number one, there's going to be sugar in there. Number two, uh, you can't fit a lot in, in a, in a gummy vitamin. So I, I'm not a big fan of those, even though I, I also enjoy taking gummies. Um, but, uh, what else are you looking for? The one I like has a really good dose of D. Um, also, you know, some, a lot of my patients get pill fatigue because they, they're already taking other things. So one that you don't have to take four or five or six to get the uh, right dose. So I, I have one that I recommend uh, that I like a lot that you only have to take one. It's actually called one and it has 2000 IU of vitamin D. It has a nice dose of B12, which I feel like a lot of people are missing as well. The only thing it doesn't have is magnesium. And that's because magnesium is a big mineral. It's hard to put into a pill. So that usually you have to take separately anyway. Um, okay, Did, uh, there's another term. So there's prebiotics, there's probiotics, and there's postbiotics. So postbiotics is when your probiotics eat your prebiotics and it creates postbiotics. And those are also con considered short chain fatty acids. Um, but there are some other substances that they release are also very important vitamins, enzymes, amino acids. So the postbiotic is just like the um, the product of this fermentation of the resistant starches. Does that make sense? And butyrate, the first one that I wrote there, is the most common. That's the most studied, and it's the most common. And I'm hearing such amazing um, information about butyrate itself. It's it's the preferred fuel um, for the gut. It also has a gut-brain connection, so it does clear out... Um, I want to say ammonia, but it it, it helps the, the brain uh, with brain fog. Um, I'm really, really enjoying what I'm reading about butyrate. Um, and butyrate, you can take as a supplement, but you can also create butyrate with what we just talked about with the prebiotics and the probiotics. Here are some of the benefits of um, not just butyrate, but some of the other postbiotics. 
So immune system support, the gut lining, it helps with hunger, mood, and healthy blood pressure and cholesterol levels. Another um, component of food or antioxidant that should be considered when you want to uh, think about gut health is polyphenols. And these are antioxidants that help um, not only prevent disease, improve brain function, but they're also there to feed the good bacteria and helps with diversity. Remember we talked about diversity of your microbiome. Um, so this helps with that. And here's a list of foods that are high in polyphenols. And they're not, most people think of polyphenols as red, purple, um, those colors, but there are other ones. That's why I wanted to make sure that you got this list. Of course, you know, um, um, raspberries and cranberries and pomegranates and red onions, um, but there's also other ones. Um, so the last R is relax, is more the stress reducing. And so just some very simple tips, especially um, prior uh, as you're eating, because um, I'm very, very into mindful eating. And so some of the easy things that you can do is uh, to sit down when you're eating. Obviously, you know, don't run around and eat. Sometimes that's harder to do than, you know, than expected. Um, but just sitting down and relaxing and looking at your meal prior to you eating, use your eyes and your nose and just appreciate it before you even start eating. And some people like to do like a little meditation or a little prayer or something to get them like in their mind to say, okay, I'm gonna enjoy this food. And then I also want, would like to tell my patients to almost challenge your food sometimes and look at it and say, okay, what is this doing for me? Is this giving me nutrients? Is this giving me protein? Is this giving me probiotics? And sometimes the answer to that, what is this doing for me? could just be joy, you know, like a, a dessert that doesn't have any nutritional value at all. And that's a hundred percent fine because the joy is very important. But what you want to do is look at the frequency of that. Do you, you don't want to do that every meal. You know, every meal shouldn't be just joy is, my, is the answer to this question. It should also start being nutrients and, you know, healthful things. Um, Pause, sit in silence, no phone, television for 30 seconds. <laughs> I thought that was funny when I, uh, the 30 seconds, because I just kind of borrowed this, this particular um, slide and I left it in there because I, I, I was, you know, I, you, you'd think it would say 30 minutes, but people actually <laughs> 30 seconds of not using their phone, it might be a lot. <laughs> and then um, chewing. Okay, so I have two uh, little um, tips for really slowing down. One of them is to put your fork or utensil down in between every bite, because if you don't, then your mind is going to go right to that next bite and not think about what's in your mouth. What's in your mouth is very important because you're going to chew it. As you chew it, saliva is produced and saliva has digestive enzymes. So really digestion starts in the mouth if you let it. And it's very important, especially for anybody who has gut issues to chew your food. I usually say 20 times. I know that's a lot. So if, if we can get 10 to 20 times, if it's a heart, a solid food, if it's like yogurt or oatmeal, you don't have to chew it 20 times. But the point is, is to make it kind of a mush to enjoy it so that you're getting satisfaction so that you're, you're eating slow and to start that digestive process, which is really, really important. Some other uh, relaxation tips is exercise. There's a there's a study that I know of that um, compared yoga to medication for IBS, and yoga and and the medication were equal. So I thought that was really interesting. Uh, sleep. So <laughs> I heard the term sleep is the new kale because sleep is is being now related to so many uh, healthful things. If you if you can if you can sleep your seven to eight hours without interruption. So if you're having sleep issues, working on it, um, they, there's some really good sleep centers um, that you can you get some sleep testing. Um, there's sleep hygiene. There's um, supplements that you can try for sleep, but just working on it is very, very important. Meditation, a lot of good studies on meditation, helping with, um, with gut health and just really overall all health. And therapy. So um, 
I just want to talk about the whole foods diet. And that's really just an unprocessed uh, food diet and show you that it's really not as hard as maybe, you know, it might sound. Um, so it starts off with protein. So you can get it from, uh, you know, whole chicken uh, or whole, even beef, whole fish, whole eggs. Um, and if you want some plant-based protein, you can use soy or you can use beans or nuts and seeds. There's plenty of options. Nuts and seeds, there you go. Fresh fruits and vegetables, both raw and cooked. I, I like to recommend both because you get new, different nutrients out of them when they're cooked and when they're with raw. A lot of these vegetables have fat-soluble vitamins, so you do need a little fat to, to help with that. So either in a dressing or cooked with olive oil or avocado oil, roasted, sauteed, um, and variety. I want to say the variety word one more time. The variety is really important for two major reasons. Number one, the different kind of nutrients that you get from, you know, every fruit, every nut, every seed, every whole grain has its own nutrient profile. So some are higher in uh, certain nutrients and lower in others. So if you've got a variety, then then you, you're sure to get everything. And the other thing is, is for the microbiome, like we talked about before, because um, different fruits and vegetables will give different prebiotic substances and resistant starches to your gut and create a more diversified environment. Um, or um, dairy, I like to recommend organic um, just so that there's no hormones and antibiotics. And um, not everybody tolerates it, but um, the kefirs, the yogurts, the ones with the probiotic would be beneficial. And then whole grains. So um, quinoa, brown rice, um, oatmeal, uh, farro, um, barley, buckwheat. There's so many out there. Even if you try one new whole grain, sorghum, there's so many great whole grains out there. Just try some. And then healthy fats. So the healthy fats are a higher omega-3 content fat. So that would be coconut, avocado, uh, any kind of a uh, uh, fatty fish oil. And this is, um, this is actually from the um, Harvard School of Health, and they um, they do all these plates, and they their studies show that a half a plate of plant food is the healthiest way to go. They said even seventy five percent would be great, but by plants I don't mean just vegetables, vegetables, fruits, anything grown from the earth. So vegetables, fruits, whole grains, nuts, seeds, they're all. Um, very important part of your diet. M really rarely any of us eats enough of them. So even if we don't start with half a plate, if we can even start with, you know, a quarter of a plate or three quarters of a plate or two thirds of a plate, just, you know, getting there um, would be great. The diversity is really important. You know, picking really good um, proteins, the am amino acids are really important um, and the carbohydrates. So, you know, there's a carb and there's a carb and any unprocessed, carb is is good it, it'll give you a lot of nutrients what you don't want is something that's too too processed too white too depleted of, of nutrients Debbie, there were um two questions that came in recently the first was from janet she asked are chia seeds as good as flax seeds and is it recommended also it is and recommended also sorry sorry go ahead What's oh no and then she added i was told to avoid probi um, probiotics while going for chemo is this true um, you're going to get different, oh, so the probiotics and chemo, um, you're going to get different, um, recommendations depending on your doctor. And I would just listen to what your doctor says, but I don't think the jury's that there's enough studies to show one way or the other, whether it's, um, it could be harmful. Um, I don't think it is, but, um, you know, I, I would, I would have you lean on your oncologist and, and listen to what they, what they recommend. Um, I, it's, there's not one answer to that, really. Sorry, um, but uh, the chia seed is very much what, uh, recommended. I happen to like, um, I happen to lean towards flaxseed more because of the uh, cancer preventative effects of it. Um, but chia seeds also is a good uh, source of um, fatty acids, plant-based fatty acids, a uh, good source of fiber, a good source of um, proteins. So yeah, it's a great option. I just lean towards the flaxseed. Okay. And then Mimi asked. If certain fruits and vegetables are difficult to process, what's your thought on balance of nature supplements? So I, I, I'm assuming it's just a brand, um, but if you're having trouble, oh, so I, I'm, it's a brand of, it sounds like maybe it's like a fruit and vegetable, like um, 
extracted in a pill, is that correct? I'm not sure what that is, but I'm assuming if it is that, then I guess there's a place for them. But no, you can never really replace a food because it's going to be lacking that resistant starch that's going to be lacking certain, you know, it'll have some antioxidants, but not all, you know, you always want to, you always want to look at the whole food uh, first. If you're having problems digesting fruits and vegetables, that's some, some gut health that you need to work on. So maybe enzymes or, you know, following, you know, a diet for a little bit, but yeah, that's um, a lot of people kind of blame the fruit and vegetable, but it's really your gut. That's the problem. And then there was one other question that came in. What do you think of Joel Furman, MD? Yeah, he's an integrative um, doctor. Um, um, I can't place exactly what is, um, you know, if maybe you can help me, um, but there's other ones too. I'm a big fan of Mark Hyman. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Mark Hyman? He's really, um, he's getting a little commercialized, but he, he's got, he's very well, you know, researched and studied. So I like what he has to say. Uh, Joel Furman, I know the name. I just can't remember if it's, uh, he's too much or too little, or I don't recall. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, the last thing that I have is my recipe de food demo. So we talked about how bone broth or even beef broth um, can help, uh, beef, chicken beef, bone broth or beef bone broth can help with, um, you know, your gut uh, health, but it can also help like your skin and it's really not hard to make. So that's the video that I want to show you guys. And let me know. I hope you can hear it. Can you hear it? <laughs> 